I'm excited to be here. It was so awesome to hear uh, the last part of Doug's um, talk. And what was great about it is I thought, I, I do this kind of work every day. We're always transforming sites into beautiful, inviting, productive, edible landscapes, oftentimes with a lot of native plants. And today I want to share with you what I've learned over the last nine years of running home harvest, edible landscapes, and construction. And I'm going to talk today primarily about soil health and also edible garden design. So I'm excited to share with you what I've learned. It's all about having fun. It's all about growing abundance. When you walk into your backyard, you harvest your own strawberries or blueberries or herbs or vegetables, it's fun. You get to engage with your landscape in an intimate way. And this connection with nature, many people are deficient in. So a garden can be a wonderful way to reconnect with nature, connect with uh, your, your own landscape, and also benefit the surrounding community. I'm really interested in sustainable agriculture. That's my degree, and that's what we do every day. It's all about supporting life however we can. The life of the plants, the life of the soil, the life of water, the life of us people, our customers. Profit is important, but it's not as important as the people or the planet. So when I'm thinking about gardening and creating gardens through uh, our business, Home Harvest, it's all about the triple bottom line, this concept of sustainability and making sure that what we're doing is, is benefiting the surrounding community, the, uh, the surrounding ecosystem. And that is under the umbrella of regeneration, regenerative thinking, regenerative landscapes, supporting life. So much of our agricultural processes and methodologies are not sustainable. We're destroying life with these large-scale monoculture systems, as Doug was talking about, the life of the bees, the life of the insects, the life of the birds. It's all connected. And our residential landscapes have the potential to be regenerative, which means they are getting stronger and more resilient and more beautiful with age, as opposed to degenerative, which means that the fertility can suffer over time. So a lot of this comes down to soil management. And my soil health guru in college, he kind of defined soil as bits of rock on their way to the ocean. I really love that simplified definition of soil because it's true. All soil, it doesn't matter where it is, it's in a perpetual state of erosion. Soil is moving towards the ocean. And the way that we manage soil can uh, keep it in place and stabilize it and improve its fertility, or it can speed up that process of eventual erosion. It's in our best interest to care for the soil because the health of the soil is uh, proportional to our health. So the, the basics of soil health is to first realize that we're dealing with something that's alive. Soil is very much living and breathing and responding to how we're manage, uh, managing it, just like any sort of living organism. Keep the soil covered, whether that's in the form of mulch or diverse plantings. Plants can keep the soil covered. Keep roots in the ground. The best way to improve soil is to be constantly feeding it in the form of organic matter or in the form of mulch. Minimize soil disturbance and above all, respect the organic matter and respect the life of the soil. If we all viewed soil as a living entity, it's easier to uh, see it with compassion and, and respect, which is what soil deserves. It's very much alive. There's billions of microorganisms in just one teaspoon of healthy soil. So when we're talking about regenerative edible landscapes, our soil should be improving over time. And, and it's possible to do that. There's this mushroom called mycorrhizal fungi that forms a beneficial symbiotic relationship with uh, over 80% of plants. This is an important part of the soil food web. And plants will give up sugars and, and nutrients that they produce and the mycorrhizal fungi absorbs those sugars and in return gives the plant greater access to water, deeper penetration for water and nutrients. And the mycorrhizal fungi forms a physical barrier around the plant roots and helps to guard against pathogens. So when we feed the soil, not only are we feeding the plants in this long-term uh, beneficial sort of warehouse of nutrients, we're also feeding the beneficial organisms that form symbiotic relationships with our plants. And this is certainly uh, beneficial for us as well because we get a higher yield and our, our produce is more nutritious when our soil is, is rich in microlife and abundant. Does anyone fertilize or irrigate a forest? Have you ever seen anyone out there watering the forest? Even in a drought last year, you know, a lot of trees died, but most of them survived. And that sort of speaks to the resiliency of nature. It's ideal if we can model our home landscapes 
um, based on the efficiencies of nature. This is, a, uh, this is a simple concept, but if we can apply this to our own landscapes, if they can be regenerative, they're lower maintenance and they can be higher yield. And there is a way to make our home landscapes uh, really beautiful as well. And aesthetics is a big part of the conversation. So we can achieve the efficiency of nature and also harmonize with the surrounding landscape and, and make these gardens really beautiful. So when people think of soil, they oftentimes think of the physical part of soil. And that's true, the sand, silt, and clay, the organic matter. But over half of the soil should be considered negative space, room for air and water. And this is really critical for healthy soil. If a soil is high in nutrients, but it's compacted, so there's no airflow, then the plants can't respire, and that's a problem. If there's no room for water, or if the water uh, is stuck there and can't drain freely, that's a problem. So, when we think about soil, think about the negative space in the soil as being important as well. Organic matter is crucial. We want to add organic matter however we can to soil. And what is organic matter? You can just call out any answers. What is organic matter? Compost. Compost. What else? Any, anything that was once alive can be considered organic matter. It could be compost. It could be mulch. It could be leaves. It could be actual plants. Plants provide organic matter as they continue to grow. And organic matter, it increases the water and nutrient holding capacity of the soil. It provides nutrients. It makes the soil more stable, less prone to erosion. And the diversity of microlife in soil and in compost, it greatly favors plant health. So there's three different types of organic matter. There's the living, that's us, that's the plants. That's the, the, the creatures that are alive right now. That's an important part of organic matter. And then you have the recently dead, the leaves that just fell from the trees in autumn, and the very dead. So very dead, it can be equated to humus. A lot of times, humus gets confused with just general compost, but they're not quite the same thing. If we were to fill this room up with compost, it would slowly decompose, and after about 15 or 20 years, you'd get left with this layer that's maybe a foot or two high. That's called humus. It's very stable, it has a high nutrient holding capacity, and it makes soils more resilient. So when we talk about organic matter, we want to be adding all three. We don't want to just put living plants in the ground, we want to put compost, and we want to put mulch, because that over time becomes the stable humus layer. And this, as a result, is going to make our gardens more prolific. And again, the point of this conversation is to realize that we are connected with the health of our home landscapes. And if our vegetables and our fruits are highly nutritious, growing in healthy soil, we benefit as a direct result. We are literally healthier as a result. Compost can be added to the surface. It can be mixed into the soil. It can be added as the plants are growing. Ideally, our home landscapes and our vegetable gardens and our edible gardens have a lot of compost. Compost is always generally positive. You just want to make sure it's well aged. So organic matter is really important. But not all organic matter is, is necessarily positive. For example, what would happen if we incorporated sawdust into our raised beds? Does anyone have a sense of what might happen? What's that? Yeah, ju if you just mixed in sawdust into your raised bed, what you would see is as the carbon is decomposing, it's sucking the nitrogen out of your raised beds, and your plants will die as a result. So plants that are high in carbon, such as sawdust or dried leaves or wood chips, you can use them, but just don't mix it into your garden soil. Whereas nitrogen, anything under 25 to 1 parts carbon to nitrogen, that's a fertilizer. And that's going to provide a lot of nutrients for our plants. So. As a mulch. Yeah. Yeah, unless you want to give that soil time to decompose that carbon, you want to assume that any high carbon source that you mix into the soil, it's going to take a little while before you can then plant right into it. So certainly, use your leaves, use wood chips, use carbon-rich materials, but keep it on the soil surface. And if you're doing a lot of digging in that area, like in a vegetable garden, use a mulch that's a little easier to use, uh, such as salt marsh hay or something like that that you can just spread away.
Uh, there's all there's all different kinds. When all the elms died from Dutch elm disease, the city planners pl put in a lot of Norway maples. They're very <coughs> resilient, hard to kill trees. They're tolerant of compaction, salt, drought, all sorts of all sorts of things. Um, so they're really common. They're street trees. They're in parks. They're weed trees. They're everywhere. Yeah. I just want to say in Wellesley, we haven't planted them here in, in over 30 years. I'm happy to hear that. <laughs> yeah, ha I'm happy to hear that. Um, back to drainage. You want there to be drainage. <laughs> if you have a fruit tree growing in a situation like this, it won't live very long. And again, nutrients are only available when the soil is saturated. So everything in life is kind of like in gardening. It's a balance. You want there to be water, but not too much water. You want the water to leave the site, but you want it to do it slowly. As the water's moving, you want to slow it and you want to spread it out. And the only time you want to see pooling water is when it's something like this, when this is intentional. If you see pooling water in your landscape, generally that's not healthy to most plants, especially the edible plants. Uh, whereas this type of watering is not ideal. Why is it not ideal to water your tomatoes or your squash plants and wet the leaves every time? Evaporation. Evaporation, that's part of it. Mold, that's a big one. Fungal issues. Water is expensive, so you want the water where the roots are. That's a reason. Um, if you wet the leaves, you're going to get more fungal diseases, such as blight on your tomatoes or powdery mildew on your squash. So I want to briefly talk about soil testing. I highly recommend doing it. Go to the University of Massachusetts Amherst website and look for the soil test lab. It takes, it takes five, 15, 5 to 15 minutes to take the samples. It costs $15. <laughs> They're going to give you plant-specific recommendations. The main reason I test soil is for lead. I find lead contamination in over half the sites that I test. Our business is based out of Arlington. This is local. We do work in Wellesley. We do work in this area. We find lead here. It's really, really common. And you don't necessarily want to dig it all out when you find it. You just want to deal with it. You want to know it's there. You want to not plant leafy greens or root crops in that soil. And the first step is to find out where it is. So let's say this is your property. And let's say this white area is your potential garden. You're going to go and take about 12 different samples, kind of zigzag across the property, take a little trowel, mix all of those together, take a handful of that, send it in a bag to the lab. That's one $15 sample. Now, if this gray area represents your house, take a separate series of samples around the perimeter of your house, because that's where we most often find lead contamination. You might find lead in this narrow strip next to your house, and then five feet over, find no lead. It's very localized. But I usually take two different samples, one series of samples, which comprises one test around the perimeter of a house, and then one series of samples, which comprises one other additional sample in the sunniest area where we're considering food. And what we often find is that there's high levels of lead right around structures, and there's lower levels of lead further away. So lead is very common. It's, it's naturally occurring in soil, but we find really highly elevated levels of lead due to leaded paint around the perimeter of houses, due to lead arsenate fungicides that have been uh, applied on old orchards. And Arlington used to be a big orchard. Greenhouses, this is farm country that it used to be. So that lead persists. It's there for hundreds of years. And uh, it's linked to mental disorders. I've tested lead at customers' properties. And the children have uh, lower IQ. They're violent. They have ADHD, autism. And I find lead everywhere on their property. There is a direct causal relationship between lead in the soil and mental health. And this is easy to prevent. This is, this is not something we should be dealing with. This is not like it's in the water and it's hard to solve the problem. If it's in the landscape, just cover it. Cover it with mulch. Don't let your children play in it. Make sure you're not breathing in the dust. That's a really common form of ingestion. The first step is knowing that it's there. Covering it is a really uh, good next step. Don't plant leafy greens, root crops, or mushrooms in lead contaminated soil. Build up with raised beds. Bring in clean soil. Do whatever you can to distance your edible food from the native soil if lead is a problem. We've done situations. Uh, or we've installed gardens where we'll put in a raised bed, bring in new soil, and under that raised bed we'll put in a heavy-duty landscape fabric, maybe five, six layers thick, and that will uh, make sure that our plants are safe. Generally, the lead doesn't go into fruit. So if you're growing fruit trees or blueberries or raspberries, generally the lead is not going to accumulate in the fruit. But if you have highly contaminated soil, I don't recommend growing in that native soil anyway. Um, this is an example of what a soil test would look like. 
You can see here the ideal range for lead is under 22, and we're over 1,000. This is common. I, I see this at least 15 times a season. We've tested hundreds and hundreds of properties, and uh, it's especially a problem for children and for pregnant women. So be mindful of it. Take a soil sample. I do a lot of consultations, and that's our first step, is testing the soil. And we find it. So it's also just a good investment. You don't need to do this every year. You don't need to test your garden soil every year. Just test it once, and then every four years, add limestone and add compost. And it's pretty simple. And if you forget all of that, the soil test will reiterate it, and it'll be specific to your site. So they make the process pretty simple, and uh, I highly recommend it. So this is a site. This had lead contamination. And so we moved the lead to a different area, and we mulched that, and, um, and then we built up with these bluestone raised beds, lined the bottom with fabric, and uh, built up with clean soil. So you can still grow plants in an area with lead. You just have to be mindful of it, and you have to be a little bit more careful, and you have to make sure that you're mulching any exposed soil. So what is healthy soil? Healthy soil, it's free from toxins, especially lead and arsenic. It's Respected and loved. We need to see soil with reverence if we want. Um, if, we, if we want to be on this planet, we need to coexist with uh, the plants and the life that's already here. Healthy soil is constantly fed, and it could be in the form of mulch or compost, or just planting a diverse garden is going to Im increase the fertility. And the most important thing is that healthy soil, it makes us healthier. And has anyone had the experience that something that you grew yourself actually tasted better? Have you ever tried a carrot from your own garden and it's actually sweeter than what you can buy, even at the farmer's market? That's actually part of the reason we have taste buds. It's things that are sweeter, in terms of from the garden, have a higher nutrient density content. So we can actually taste the difference between something we grow and something um, that has been aged. So we need to respect soil. We oftentimes plant trees in these little tiny areas, just a little bit more space and the trees thrive. So plant more trees, increase the soil fertility of your site. And I want to transition now into garden design so we can apply a lot of these invisible concepts of soil fertility to actual built installations, which is what we specialize in. So rather than teach you how to make a pretty picture on a paper, I want to teach you how to think about design from an intuitive standpoint and start to think about um, concepts rather than rather than details. So the first question is, what can a fence be used for? You just throw out ideas. Neighbors. Privacy, neighbors, support. Support. Trellis. support, trellis. Exactly. So you're already thinking about it like that. Most people build a fence for one purpose, but what about frost protection? Keep the frost rolling down the hill off of your off of your uh, off your garden. What about livestock management? What about on the north side of your fence, growing shiitake mushrooms or a shade garden? What about a garden trellis or a windbreak for your garden? What about an attractive feature? How many different functions can each design element serve? This is a really cool way to think about every purchase or every decision that you make with your garden. And what about a sound barrier? What about an attractive feature? Every single design element has the potential to do many different things. It's up to us to be creative. This was a privacy screen that we built from found objects that we welded together into a sculpture. It's a privacy screen, it's beautiful, and it grows grapes. So several different functions in that one design element. What can a road or a patio be used for? Most people, it's just one thing, driving or walking. What about heat storage? What about storing your fig trees on that asphalt and they benefit from that radiant heat? What about rosemary? What about chili peppers that like the heat? We can benefit from the sort of side effects of the intended use, and it makes our gardens more beautiful, more multifunctional. It's something to consider. What about a fire break? What about a plant barrier to control your mint or your running bamboo? When designing, try to imagine all the potential of every idea and how many functions can each design element serve. This is true about construction elements. It's also true about plants. What can a tree be used for? An attractive feature. Usually that's the only reason that someone plants a tree. But what else? It could be designed for shade, a food source, erosion control, a, wi a windbreak, a privacy screen, medicinal use, pleasant aromas, firewood, wildlife attractant. What else? The list goes on and on and on. This is just to start thinking about conceptually every single thing we introduce in our landscape. It could be checking multiple boxes. It could be achieving multiple results. 
So this is uh, an American persimmon tree. It's beautiful. It's drought tolerant. It's
space, and it's beautiful. So stacking functions, think about how the microclimates will be changing throughout the season. And when you start thinking about garden design, look to nature for inspiration. Who designed this leaf? Who designed the moon? Who designed this mushroom? We can start looking at these natural elements and incorporate them into a very simple, elegant design. So this is called the crescent garden. This is about 90% edible, uh, but it looks very ornamental. You cannot tell that these squash plants have powdery mildew or these blight uh, or these uh, strawberry, uh, sorry, tomato plants have blight because we've hidden the potentially less attractive edibles with the more attractive flowers. So there are ways that this garden can be really beautiful and harmonious with nature and inspired by, by natural curves and natural designs. Why does a rust look like that? Why is it so similar uh, to the way artichokes look or the way a lily pad looks or the way fennel flowers look? Or garlic, we often see these concentric circles. This is a banana that's been cut. This is a gourd with a virus on it. We see these parallel concentric lines. Now, applying that to your garden, you know, what if your mulch pathways resemble these parallel curving lines in nature or this one central point concept? This is a garden we did in, uh, in Hawaii. So curves sometimes make sense. This garden is accessible by reaching in from the outside or walking through this path on the inside. And everything in this garden is laid out such that there's nothing shading anything else. Straight parallel lines in nature are common. So there are definitely times when it's not appropriate to use curving lines in your designs. Uh, with rectilinear spaces, we need to respond with rectilinear lines. Here, a curving line wouldn't really make sense. This is a grape arbor that we built. So one of these photos is a tree, one is a lung, and one is a river delta. The same patterns are repeated throughout nature. And we start to, when you start to notice these patterns, you start to realize that the same patterns repeat over and over and over again. So the way that the cream blends in your coffee, the way that your fingerprint looks, the way that the galaxy or hurricane looks, it's the same pattern. Look deep into nature and you will understand everything, as Einstein said. So this is the Fibonacci sequence. If anyone's interested in patterns in nature, I highly recommend looking into it, the golden ratio. Fibonacci sequence, we incorporate this subtly into most of our gardens. One plus one is two, two plus three is five, three plus five is eight, and so on. When you map it, you get these logarithmic spirals, and this can be incorporated subtly into your landscape, and it will make it more beautiful. Nature is the best teacher. It's been said that nature holds the original patent on every human invention. If we look to the way nature does things, we'll get the most efficient, energy-conserving, and beautiful result. So these fractals in nature, whether it's an herb spiral in your backyard. The world is not to be put in order. The world is in order. It is for us to put ourselves in unison with this order. So you're the designer now. What questions do you need to ask about your own property? Is it sustainable to do something that's unattractive in your front yard, even if the end goal <laughs> is regenerative? I don't think so. I think aesthetics are an important part of the conversation. In the center of campus, is it sustainable to harvest water but then use duct tape to grow things on it. So we need to be mindful not only of the concept of sustain sustainability, but how our garden harmonizes with the existing paradigm. Aesthetics is really important. If your neighbor sprays chemicals on their lawn and they look at your beautiful pollinator garden, they're going to want one. Aesthetics is usually the first thing that people want in terms of a purchase, but you can achieve awesome sustainable results if you're a little bit more uh, mindful and uh, just thinking about how your garden is going to relate to your neighbor's gardens or, or, and so on. So aesthetics is important. So this is a before and after. Um, we were thinking about wildlife. We were thinking about water movement. We were asking questions about access. We sketched over a very simple, primitive uh, satellite image. And then we transitioned this landscape into a really robust, edible garden with a greenhouse. That's an electric fence that we bait to keep deer and wildlife out. Uh, this, is, this garden produces thousands of dollars worth of food every year. And it's a pollinator garden, it's a medicinal garden, there's all sorts of fruit trees, and it's a wonderful space. So very quickly, some of our favorite plants, Asian pear, hardy kiwi, grapes, nut trees, blueberries are native. Everyone should plant more, more blueberries. Raspberries, pawpaws are also native. These grow in the shade, and they're really, really delicious. We're growing them at our nursery. The American persimmon, I think this is an underappreciated fruit. 
the pawpaw, the American persimmon, they don't have a long shelf life, so that's why you don't see them at the farmer's market. But in a backyard, they do really, really well, and they're beautiful plants. Plums, strawberries, garlic, microgreens, any sort of annuals. Grow it all. Grow as much as you possibly can and have, and have fun with it. Nature is resilient, and connecting with nature is important. And in the nine years that I've been doing this, I really do think that growing your own food is the most sustainable option. And we create these physical transformations in people's yards, and it ends up creating this sort of internal transformation. You start to see your landscape differently. You start to realize that we are connected with nature. We are connected with our landscapes, and we have the potential to make them regenerative, and beautiful and productive and low maintenance and this is something that we all can be doing all the world's problems can be solved in a garden and the ultimate goal of farming is not the growing of crops but the cultivation and perfection of human beings you not only benefit from the aesthetics and the yield but you benefit from just working with the plants we have become nature deficient in our society and a garden is like a gateway into the natural world, and it's something that we all have access to. So thank you so much for, uh, for listening to this presentation. And I'm happy to uh, answer any questions for the, for the remainder of this time. It depends on how much you have. If you have three strawberries, that's going to be a bummer when your bunny rabbit eats all those strawberries. If you have 300 strawberries, it's not going to be as much of a problem. So quantity is part of it. Uh, exclusion is part of it. Sometimes having an electric fence, that's been the most effective strategy for deer and uh, groundhogs. Sometimes um, having biodiversity can really help a lot as well. Uh, but in my backyard, a lot of these photos were taken of the strawberries. We don't have any fencing, and we get a lot of strawberries. But just rely on biodiversity and quantity. And, uh, How do you plant your strawberries? Everywhere? Just everywhere. Yeah, around, around paths. Um, if you have another flower garden, they can't spread into the shade. So just anticipate where they're going to spread and let them be there and let them kind of take over. Yeah. Mm. I love fig trees. Yeah, we yeah we have our own nursery and we're growing a lot of fig trees. And it is so much fun to walk in there in the middle of summer and actually harvest figs before I've sold the trees. And it, it's it's a lot of fun. Um, planters um, in pots they dry out fast. And patio is a thermal mass, so it's going to absorb a lot of heat and it's going to be a hot microclimate. So you want to make sure that whatever pot you have, it's it's sizable, you know, half a whiskey barrel or larger. <coughs> uh, whatever you do, you're going to have success if you're watering and if you're, you know, keeping in mind that the more soil medium, the, the better. Yeah. Is there a special variety of figs? That does of figs? Yeah. Uh, I like Chicago Hardy and I like uh, brown turkey fig. Um, but, you know, they're, so, they're sort of cold hardy here, not really. So I grow them as sort of elaborate house plants. I'll grow them outside in pots. And then I'll bring them inside into the basement and just let them be dormant over, over winter in the basement. Water them a few times over the winter. But um, I'm growing zone seven figs in pots and then just bring them into the basement. Yeah. Where do you, where do you find them? Where do you, where do you we have our own nursery. It's really hard to find these trees. Oh, like pawpaws, persimmons, no one has them. So we have them. <laughs> Mahoney sometimes does, but not always. Do you sell retail? Yeah, yeah. It's, just, it's not an open nursery available to the public. It's more for our customers where we're coming in and doing these transformations. Yeah. My, most of my property is very shaded. Are there plants that you'd recommend? I, mean, I think you mentioned microgreens. Microgreens, herbs, you know, when you're dealing with less than three hours, there's not much. You can try growing mushrooms. You can try growing shiitake or wine cap or oyster mushrooms. I've had success with that in full shade. Pawpaws are the only tree that will fruit in less sun. Amelanchier or uh, juneberry, serviceberry, that's an edible native plant that does well in part sun. But every part sun plants still need some sun. So if you, if you have full shade, there's not a lot that's going to really grow. Yeah. How do you grow mushrooms? How do you grow mushrooms? Do you eat look, look up Paul Stamets and, and see how he does it, because there's a lot of literature on it. Shiitakes, you grow in oak logs, and you drill into it, and you plug the spawn into those plugs and seal it, I think with beeswax. I've grown oyster mushrooms on fresh wood chips, 
that's really easy to do. You get grain spawn sent in the mail, put your wood chips down, put your grain spawn down, cover it with a little bit of wood chips, and that's it. Yeah. It's just, it's not like a tomato where you watch it grow and you're like, oh, there it is. It's like you've got a lot of mushrooms all at once and you never know when they're going to come. So there, it's, that's the hard part. It's, it's not the growing them, it's just the, the uncertainty of when to harvest. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. American persimmon, Diospryos virginiana. It's an awesome tree. I just fell in love with it. Um, they ripen here. Yeah, they ripen here. It's zone four, so it's actually very cold hardy. You don't even have to climb the tree. You just shake it, and the ripe persimmons will fall. They get big. They're about 30-foot trees. And uh, we, uh, one thing I wanted to note about the American persimmon is um, we're donating about 100 trees this year. I'm starting a nonprofit, and we're focusing on the American persimmon. So we've planted them at schools, at prisons, at, uh, we're trying to get into hospitals. So if anyone knows of an institution, ideally lower income, that would want some fruit trees, we've already donated over 30, and we're trying to get to 100 this season. But definitely grow the American persimmon. Asian persimmon is actually better, in my opinion, but it's marginally cold hardy. It's zone 6, which we're supposed to be, but you never know. It needs full sun. It needs full sun, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it depends. Um, if you have a highly contaminated site and you put down two feet of compost, that's a lot of compost. It's going to release a lot of nutrients over the scale of a farm. That's not sustainable. Once you get over about 10% organic matter, it's like luxury. You don't need that organic matter. When we're dealing with highly contaminated sites, I'm not concerned about that. I just want as much distance as I can between the plants and the native soil. So you can overdo it on a large scale. It's really hard to overdo it on a small scale. And when we do excessive compost applications, it's usually in contaminated sites. So, so I'm, I'm just growing in compost now. I, just go for it. But it's old. It's old, com old compost. Yeah, yeah. Right? We'll go two feet. Yeah. That's a lot of compost. <laughs> two, no, you, know, you don't need it's that much. It's not, not a nutrient issue? Or You're going to have excessive. <coughs> no, you want, you want to make sure it drains. Um, cut it with loam if you want. And, yeah, so uh, yeah, you gotta you gotta research it. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. It it it, it, it fluctuates. I would say you gotta do your homework about about that one. A contractor that just excavated someone else's yard. It could have lead. Um, and loam doesn't mean anything it, anymore. It's supposed to be a, a combination of sand, silt, and clay, but it doesn't even really mean that anymore. It just means ro like soil without rocks in it. So there's no guarantee it's free from lead or free from disease or you know free from glass. So just be conscious of where you get your loam from. Yeah, there's not really a, a great source. I, I like Weiss Farm. Their compost loam is, is good. Uh, but you have to know the people you're, you're working with. You know, having done this nine years, I just won't buy from certain people. Yeah. So what do you mean by compost? Do you mean, uh, like aged like compost, which is usually... you purchase or you do yourself? Both. We're, we're dealing with like thousands of cubic, <coughs> cubic yards of compost. It's hard to make that much. We make our own, but it's not that much. So, yeah, we usually buy it. We buy it in bulk and we store some of it and we, yeah. One more question. Sure. Yeah, any other questions? Sure. How do you feel about cow manure? I love cow manure. I, I like, <laughs> I love cow manure. <laughs> I, I, I like all manure. <laughs> you just have to make sure it's composted. You don't want to put fresh cow patties on your garden. It can, it can harbor pathogens. It can be too hot, too much nitrogen. So any manure is fine as long as it's composted and it, it needs to be cool. If you're getting a compost delivery and it's really hot, it need, it's not aged enough. If you're using manure and it, it smells really bad, it's, that's, don't use it. Let, it. let it age a little longer. One more question. How long uh, chicken, chicken manure, how long should it be? Uh... It, it's, it's not a question of how long, it's a question of uh, how much manure. If you're dealing with a pile that's the size of this room, it'll keep decompose much faster. If you're dealing with a small quantity, it could take two years. So anywhere between two months and two years. You probably, if it smells bad, it's not ready. If it looks like manure, it's not ready. If, uh, if it's hot, it's not ready. So it should look like soil, and you should be able to hold it and smell it. It shouldn't smell like manure. If it does, you've got to let it sit longer. Or mix it into your soil and then, and then wait another few, few weeks. Yeah. But okay. thank, thank you all so much. You. Yeah. Please take some... Uh, Take some business cards. Um, we do a lot of sustainable work in the area. We're based out of Arlington. We use a lot of native plants. We have our own nursery. We do a lot of construction. 
lot of stonemasonry. So please call us up. <laughs>